You're listening to TIP. We sit down with Mavon, who is the co-founder and CEO of Veeam. Veeam is a global payments network helping small businesses transfer money internationally. We talk about how much has the banking system really changed in the last 50 years? What's in store for the future of fintech? How can these well-established financial systems change? And what does cryptocurrency have to do in combination with transfer money globally? Fascinating interview, so enjoy. You are listening to Silicon Valley by The Investors Podcast, where your host, Sean Flynn, interviews famous entrepreneurs and business leaders in tech. Discover how money is made in Silicon Valley and where tech is going before it gets there. Marwan, could you talk about your journey? before and founding this amazing company, Veeam. Yeah, thank you. I started Veeam in 2014. I used to run e-commerce for Western Union. It was in a startup called Ebil Me, which I found and sold to Western Union. I uh, started the business to make it really simple for businesses around the world to move money to pay and get paid. Typically, businesses send money on Bankwire, and that whole experience is painful for both the payer and the receiver. We wanted to simplify the experience and we're not really looking for minor changes to that process. We're looking to have a very different, a fundamentally different experience to the user. So we started Veeam to replace Bankwire and offer something that's very modern, a very modern experience to the user. Does that mean that the banks just haven't modernized or changed at all over the years? Bankwire has been around for decades. It has seen very little innovation for many, many years. It's an area that's ripe for innovation. If you think of what you have to do today to move money on Bankwire, as a payer, you have to think of when is the right time to do it during the day, to do that transaction. There's a form you have to fill. You got to figure out all the information about the receiver, the SWIFT code, the currency purse. You got to figure out how to fill it on the form. Sometimes you can do the form online. Sometimes you have to show up and do the paperwork in person. After you fill all the necessary information, you have to provide a fee for the bank wire. You have to figure out foreign exchange. You got to make sure you do it before cutoff time. And when you send the money, you don't really know what happened to that money until the receiver tells you, I received your money. The same thing for the receiver. The receiver doesn't really know when they're going to get paid. So they're constantly checking the bank account. Hey, is there money in my bank account? And when they receive money, they discover that's not exactly what they were hoping to receive because they're sending you an invoice in US dollars. They're getting euros deposited in their bank account. And then they wake up and it's like, okay, that's not really the amount of euros I expected to get. They have to figure out how to match the euros deposited with the invoice that has been sent. This whole thing is an awkward experience that's full of friction for both the payer and the receiver just change it completely so then how are you disrupting it what are you doing different than what the banks are doing is really based on a fundamental premise that the entire thing should be done in second the way to imagine the experience when you register online you log in you enter the email address of the recipient that you're sending money to the amount of money you owe, you hit send. The entire thing is done in 10 seconds. The receiver gets a message that they're getting paid. It displays the US dollar amount, it displays the local amount. When the receiver accepts the payment, we pick up money in one country, deposit money in another country. So the first level of innovation that's completely different than the bank is that user design, the interactions between the payer and the payee. We make it really simple for the payer to send money. All you need is an email and an amount. We give a lot of data to the recipient so that when they receive the payment, they're able to reconcile and make sure that they understand what payment belongs to what invoice. So that's on the user experience level. The second thing that's very different than a bank, the way we move money, we design something called multi-rail, which is essentially a payment router that routes money on different methods of moving money. The first rail, we call it treasury, which is our own bank accounts in different markets around the world. So for example, in that setting, if I'm moving money to Germany, 
there's nothing that moves to Germany. I have a bank account in euros in Germany, and I use that bank account to remit euros to the recipient. We call that treasury. That's the first rail. The second rail is, is crypto. We use it to move in and out of crypto to essentially cross from one currency to another. Think of it as a way to quickly flip from one currency to another using crypto as an intermediary mechanism of moving money. The third type of rails that we use is access to payment providers around the world. And then we also have access to SWIFT. So we're constantly going in and out between these different rails to figure out what's the best way to move the money for the customer. The transactions are recorded on the blockchain, which makes it really interesting from tracking and making sure that the transactions are recorded on a ledger that can be made available to the customer. How are you allowing small businesses to compete on the global market? You know, one of the things that's fascinating about small business today versus small business years ago is that today with the advent of technology, there's a very good chance that when you start a business, your first customer is going to be in Singapore or, or China or Philippines. It used to be that you start a business and your customers are going to be local. Now with the rise of eBay and Alibaba and Amazon and Google and YouTube and all these technologies, it's very simple to connect buyers and sellers around the world. And so if you're a small business, your market is not limited to the geography that you're in. You can sell anywhere in the world and tools make it really simple to conduct business, which is making these businesses become more and more global over time. Are the banking systems globally consistent or are the banks in Russia, China, England, France, all completely different? Well, the correspondent banking system, which moves money from uh, one country to another, is really duct taping of domestic payment systems around the world. And so every country has its own story in terms of what can be done or cannot be done. And so we find the experiences vary and are nuanced every country that you work with. Our job is to simplify all this and hide the complexity and make it so that the experience is uh, simple, unified, consistent, regardless of the country that you're dealing with. So we keep the same price, same experience, the same look and feel to the product, regardless of the country combinations you're trying to work with. So you'd mentioned before your multi-tiered system, and one of the tiers was crypto. I see that in the news quite often with Bitcoin rising and falling. How does that affect the transfer payments when every day that's such a volatile market. So one of the things we've done is we go in and out of crypto regardless of the price of any of these instruments. We essentially don't hold inventory and don't care for the price because we're going in and out almost real time. So the price of the currency doesn't really matter. We're using it to cross between currencies and uh, we make sure that all the p l adds up before the transaction is conducted. So we're not necessarily, first of all, we're agnostic to the type of currency that we use and we're not necessarily watching the price or holding inventory. We go in and out real time. It's like a utility to cross from one, from one currency to another. Do you have locations, offices around the world? How are you able to provide such services? Yeah, we operate in 110 countries that we can send money to, we can pick up money or enable send from another 50 around the world. The way we work, we have exchange partners for the crypto rail that we can tap into. So for example, if we're sending money to Philippines, we have access to exchanges on the ground in Philippines that we have our own accounts in. And we use that, we use the partners on the ground to move money to the recipient. When it comes to our own treasury systems, we have bank accounts in different markets covering Europe, pound, US, Canada, Australia. These are examples of countries where we have our own bank account infrastructure and our own wallets. And again, it's what we have developed is the idea of actually routing payments between multiple rails to optimize the user experience so that it's seamless to you when you're sending money or receiving money. 
So at this point, are investors coming to you or are you still going out to them? Well, it's a combination. We definitely have a flow of investors coming in and asking about the company. And we also have relationships in the market that we maintain. You know, as you know, in this business, you're always raising capital. And so both investors coming in and us reaching out are sort of a way that we uh, keep doing this to keep the relationships going. When we started the company, the initial capital came from Kleiner Perkins. They did Series A. Following that, we did Series B with Google Ventures and National Australian Bank. On Series A, we had Kleiner Perkins and Silicon Valley Bank. And then following the Google Ventures uh, Series B one, we ended up doing another round with Goldman. We have a number of bank investors, so Silicon Valley Bank. National Australian Bank, SBI, other Japan, a fund called KIP, other China. So we have a fairly global, diverse investor base. And one of the things that we are interested in, given that this is a global company, is having access to investors around the world. For example, you know, when we're looking for help in China, we have investors in China that can give us a good idea of what's going on in the China local market. And so we think of investors as a way to help us get knowledge on what's going on on the ground in the markets that they're in. The investors from the past, how excited were they to hear of your new venture? Did they want to put money in? How were those relationships? You maintain relationships across the board from the current company and the previous companies. You know, every time you start a new company or a new way of doing things, you obviously engage the right investors to figure out how to help you build the company forward. So one of the things that I look for is figuring out who are the investors that can help us build the company forward. And you're looking for strategic help. So, you know, whether that access to people, access to companies, access to the industry, these are all different ways to get help to build the company forward. And your team from day one, How hard was it to recruit? How hard was it to get people on board to follow your vision? It's an exciting space that we're in. Fintech in general is one of the happening markets. There's a lot of activity in this space. It's a sexy market to be in. And then on top of that, generally cross-border payments is another really good market to be in. It's It's a large market with big pain points. Blockchain is another interesting angle that attracts a lot of engineers and Folks are curious on how the blockchain is going to evolve and develop over time. And so it has, you know, a lot of characteristics that are attractive to folks that are looking for new opportunities. How was it at the very beginning trying to build the platform and actually get those first customers? Early days, it's more engineering heavy because you're building stuff. And then the sales are strategic. You're just trying to get the first set of customers to work with the product and give you feedback on what the product is like and what they want to change. Over time, as you start building up, it sort of shifts and changes and becomes more customer centric, becomes more heavy on product and marketing. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like this is an idea when you're trying to scale it, it needs to be scaled through marketing and product efforts. And so the company over time, it starts to index more towards sales, marketing, product you know, skill set. Early days, it's more engineering skill set. So where in that life cycle is Veeam right now? Yeah, we're beyond product market fit and initial traction. We're definitely into large growth and scalable growth. That's the stage we're in. Of all the options around the world, why did you pick San Francisco to be your headquarters? A lot of new ideas are here in San Francisco novel approaches to payments and different ways of making changes to an experience. Also, you know, access to capital in San Francisco. There is a large number of VCs that have seen success and have seen large companies build and seen scale. Do you have any customer stories from people that have used Veeam? A customer that sent money to Brazil and it was like $70,000. And it took, I think, like 10 days for 
the money to show up in Brazil. And that customer was telling me that it would have been faster to just hop on the plane and drop off the money and get it over with. <laughs> and actually that customer was asking me if bank wire is electronic. And I said to him, yeah, it is electronic. And so he was asking me why, if it's bits and bytes, how do bits and bytes get stuck so long for bits and bytes to deliver? Because you're thinking, you know, when I send an email to Brazil, I mean, it's, the email is there. Why is it that email and information and content move so quick, but money sits all these days on the way to Brazil? That's an interesting, simple question. So what I explained to him that with so many intermediaries, the funds are sitting in batch processes overnight and there's many hops and so it takes longer for the money to show up to the destination. We have a customer here in California that wanted to send money to China and the bank won't let him do it online. He had to actually show up in person. And this is like 2019 we're talking about. So the guy drove to the branch, filled the wire form. When he was there at the branch, he was doing it in the middle of the day and China was like sleeping because of the time difference. He needed to get information about the recipient to add to the wire form. So he had to, you know, search his mobile phone to pick up all the information necessary. And one of them was the Swift code. He couldn't figure out like what actually is the Swift code that he needs to put in the field to send money to China. Anyway, he got the information, he filled it on the form. He, I think he had the wrong information on the form and gave the data to the teller, sent the money. Two or three days later, it turns out that the money got declined. And so he had to drive back to the branch to do it again. He got really frustrated because every time he goes to the branch, it's like half an hour to get there, half an hour to come back, plus the time it takes to do this transaction. He's a busy guy. I mean, his guys are just busy trying to figure out how to sell and to service their customer. The last thing that they want is figuring out how payments work. Like they just want to do it. And so we explained to him that, you know, with Veeam, like all you have to do is enter the email address of the recipient, which he had on his mobile phone, the amount of money that he owed, which he remembered by heart. He got the transaction done. And it was like a really simple experience that he could have done in his sleep, in his bed, instead of going to the branch and doing this transaction. So that's an example of analog, old-fashioned ways of doing things versus a more modern technology. Is there any insurance on the money? We're a money service business, so we're essentially, uh, because we have to be registered in the various states in the U.S., there is bonding requirements that you have to submit to guarantee or to back up the volume that you move. You know, that whole process in the U.S. takes two to three years to get it done. Fairly expensive as well. But, you know, you have to do it in order to move money. And the thing is, there aren't that many companies in the U.S., all the licenses. So it's definitely an asset that's valuable. Venmo, PayPal, and the other payment methods out there, how are you different from them? Venmo is a domestic payment option in the U.S. for consumers. PayPal is international consumer-to-consumer e-commerce. We're specialized in B2B transactions that tend to be larger in size. So we're not dealing with, you know, $100 payments. We tend to deal with $10,000 payments. They're more like wire replacements. So that's how we're different than Venmo and PayPal. We're actually like Venmo for businesses international. For banks that see what you're doing right now, how come they just don't copy you or try to compete with you or who knows, maybe acquire you very soon? I think there's an opportunity for the banks to look at what we've built as a model for what next generation payments are going to look like. And there's an opportunity to team up with the banks to offer functionality to their business audience to simplify the function of paying and getting paid for their customer base. So I see quite a bit of opportunity with the banks to team up with them, both for payment processing and also for access to a customer base that is looking for 
a different way of moving money around the world. And what do you think is the future for fintech and the banking system in general? I think there's a lot of innovation coming to that whole, to the entire fintech space. I mean, this is a space that have not seen innovation for such a long period of time and it's been ripe for different ways, different experiences. And technology has enabled now a way to simplify these fintech experiences and not only simplifying them, but reducing the cost structure, reducing intermediaries, reducing back and forth, which simplifies the entire way businesses experience any of these fintech services. So I think for what we've seen so far is, is really the tip of the iceberg. I think we're going to see a sustained innovation for a long period to come in all aspects of fintech, from payments to banking, to lending, to credit card acquiring. The entire area, the entire segment is up for quite a bit of disruption. And what do you think is the future for digital currency? The power is really in the blockchain. And I think that's a foundational technology that's going to disrupt a lot of industries because the blockchain really at the heart of it removes the concept of a middleman and connects the endpoints directly, the payer and the payee, the buyer and the seller. And so we're big fans of the technology itself that we use to essentially move money around. The currency, the concept of a digital currency that can be used around the world has its own investors and audience and fans. We're bigger fans of the actual technology behind it, which is the blockchain. So think of the blockchain as a distributed ledger or distributed spreadsheet. Think of a spreadsheet running around the world on all kinds of servers and they're all talking to each other. So every time you make an entry on one spreadsheet that propagates the changes to other spreadsheets. And this is basically what the blockchain is. It's a system of tracking entries on a ledger and synchronizing these entries on servers around the world. And that technology essentially allows for value to be transferred from one point to another without having a middleman that coordinates that movement. And so it ends up disrupting all kinds of industries. Payments is the first industry that benefited from this technology. But if you think of this more holistically, it's a way to disrupt insurances, lending, trade finance, mortgages, real estate. You know, all these industries that have a series of companies in the middle that used to add value because of the complexity of the environment they're in. Now they can benefit from this technology to simplify the interactions and connect the endpoints together peer to peer. So with all these past successes, what's it like the process of when your company is about to get acquired? It's a process of discovery of, you know, the, what you built is connecting and valuable to other products within the company that's essentially buying. So you're always looking to see what the synergies are between products, geographies, markets, people, to then figure out how to connect the dots and provide value to the new buyer. So have you already started thinking about your next idea? Well, this one is, you know, fairly, the market is sizable and large and the pain point is big and so we're focusing on simplifying this experience and making sure that we can benefit business user so that they're not using wire anymore and they're using a simpler technology so we're quite focused on this mission so in other words you're going to keep doing more and more startups till you're in the grave <laughs> I, I guess so yeah marwan thank you for your time today on silicon valley and we also want to thank alan tian who made the introduction that allowed this interview to happen. His information will also be in the show notes. So once again, Marwan, thank you. And we look forward to having you on the show in the future. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. 
This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.